Esther 2, you can open your Bible there at Esther chapter 2. We're going to back up a little bit tonight. We're going to back up and uh, look at something that we looked that, I, that, that we didn't really look at last week, but we considered it. Let me get you right to the paper because this will, and I think you'll find this to be very interesting. In our study in the book of Esther, we've been looking at the hand of God behind the scenes as he was working to make provisions to save the Jews from certain death. Last week, I raised a question that I want to go back to. And here was the question that I raised. Why would Mordecai enter Esther into this Persian beauty pageant? Why would he do that? And, and it was interesting because some people had come to me after church and they had given me different ideas about that. But watch what I have here. As I read Esther 2.8 and I look at word meanings, I'm convinced that Mordecai most likely did not enter her, but instead she was taken without a choice. Watch verse 8 of chapter 2. Let, let me show you the verse, and then I'll show you the word that we want to look at. Verse 8 says this, So it came to pass when the king's commandment, there's, that gives you a little bit of a hint right there, that he gave a commandment that the young virgins in all the 127 provinces were to be gathered. So this is a command that is issued, okay? So that tells you right away that uh, it wasn't an invitation, okay? So it, it wasn't an invitation to say to somebody, well, if you want to be in this and you're a young lady, you can enter this. It, it was a commandment. So watch this. So it came to pass when a king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered, see what they did? They gathered them uh, together into Sushan the palace to, to the custody of Haggai. And Esther was brought. That's the word I want to look at in a moment. Also under the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. So it's the word brought. So come back here to your paper. Let me show you something. This verse tells us that Esther was brought also. The word brought here shines some much-needed light upon the situation. Notice how the word is defined by the Blue Letter Bible. Here's what it can mean. It means to take, to get, fetch, lay hold of, seize, receive, acquire, buy, bring, marry, take a wife, snatch, take away. So consider that with the command that was given, and I really don't think she had a choice. And I don't think Mordecai put her up to this. I think that somebody knew of her beauty, no doubt, because she was so beautiful. And so they knew of her. They didn't know that she was a Jew, but they knew of her. And so for that reason, she was sought. And whenever she was found, she was taken. She was taken and she was entered into this. Now watch. Let me go on with this. As I look at the meanings of the word, I come to realize that Esther most likely was taken by the king's men as they searched for young virgins to enter the contest. This entire situation, now watch this, was the result of sinful man carrying out the desires of the flesh. But God would use it all to accomplish his purpose. Then that makes far more sense, anyhow. Those who would take Esther would be held accountable for their actions someday. It may not be until the great white throne judgment, but there will be a day of reckoning. Just like those that had arrested those that had, that had crucified Christ, they, that all played right into the plan of God. But those individuals were also held accountable, will be held accountable for what they had done in their actions. Sure, it was a part of God's plan, but they were still responsible for their actions. Same thing right here. It's no different. But watch the application because there's so much here to consider. There's encouragement for our lives in what happened to Esther. She would be taken against her will, but God would use the situation for her benefit as well as all the Jews in Babylon. There are many biblical examples of people experiencing difficulty at the hands of sinful people in the end result being a blessing. Watch this. Think about Joseph and how he suffered at the hands of sinners. His brothers sold him into slavery. Potiphar's wife falsely accused him and he had and had placed him in prison for several years. God, however, used all of his hardships to bring about a blessing for the entire nation of Israel. And even specifically for Joseph, became, because he became the prime minister of Egypt. Let me go on. About Daniel and his friends, they were taken into captivity and found themselves in many high-pressure and difficult situations. The 
the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den. Watch this. But in all of it, here's the key. God was glorified. God was glorified. Now watch the top of page two. Let us understand and always remember that the unifying theme in the Bible is the glory of God. God's great purpose is to make himself known to the world. This is the great emphasis of the Bible. God's great concern is to glorify himself and to make himself known to all men. That is God's purpose. Some people will try to teach you that God's purpose is redemptive, that his purpose is to save sinful men. The one way that, that you can see that that's not the case would be to go back to Noah's day. Because in Noah's day, if that was, the, if that was God's purpose, if that was his ultimate purpose to save sinful man, that is one of his purposes. But if that was his ultimate purpose, then you would have to say he failed because only eight people were saved. And as I told you whenever we studied Genesis, it's believed that there could have been up to 10 billion people on the earth. So if, if his purpose was redemptive, then he didn't do very well back there. God's purpose is not redemptive. The theme, the, under, the, the, the unifying theme of the Bible is that God will be glorified. I'm going to show you some verses. How about Joshua 4, 2, 23 and 24? It says, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan before you, until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were going over. Watch this, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord. How about 1 Samuel 17 45 and 46 i didn't i forgot to underline what i wanted to emphasize but i'll get it here then said david to the philistine this is david and goliath thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield but i come to thee in the name of the lord of hosts the god of the armies of israel whom thou hast defied this day will the lord deliver thee into my hand and i will smite thee and take thy head from thee and i will give the carcass of the hosts of the philistines this day under the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth here comes the reason that all the earth may know that there is a god in israel you see that and then so this theme flows right through the scriptures watch first kings 8:43. hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people israel and that they may know that this house which i have builded is called by thy name let me give you another one about ezekiel 36 22 and 23 therefore say unto the house of israel thus saith the lord god i do not this for your sake so house of israel but for my own or but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the heathen whither you went and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Watch the next line on your paper at the top of, uh, the top of page 3. Here's what it says. These are just a few verses that help us to see the unifying theme of the Bible, which is that God will be glorified. Meaning that in the events that take place, he will be made known. This is what is happening in the days of Esther. Esther was taken against her will. And the people who took her, uh, it should say her, would be held accountable. God would use the situation to glorify himself as this would eventually lead to the salvation of the Jews. Catch this. Okay, so you take that underlying theme of the entire scriptures that God is going to be glorified. And you look at this scene right here. And if, if you and I, if you lived in that day, okay, if, if you lived in that day and, and you were close to Esther, you and I would say, why does she have to be pulled into the middle of all of this? What good can possibly come from this? Because we can't see beyond the moment that we are in. But it, what we wouldn't realize is this, that God was permitting that to happen 
so that eventually the Jews are going to be, they're going to receive the salvation. They're going to be set free from the, the death sentence that's going to be pronounced upon them. But that's not the, that's not the ultimate reason. The ultimate reason in all of the events that lead up to that is that God would be glorified so that nobody can leave this book and nobody can say, well, this is, it was a coincidence that the king had a feast. It was a coincidence that Vashti was, was deposed. And, and it's a coincidence that, that there was a beauty pageant that was held. And it's a coincidence that, that Esther found grace in, in the eyes of Haggai and and that we're going to go on here tonight. And, and somebody say it was a coincidence that she became the next queen. No, it's not. It is God's hand. And that's what this letter is teaching us. That's what God wants us to know. But look, I want to go on with this. Watch this. In our lives, there are situations that arise that we have no control over. You know that. I know that. They are often very difficult trials to go through. They can be painful. They can be heartbreaking at times. They may leave us scarred for the rest of our lives. They may, they may be brought about by the choices of sinful people, such as this right here in Esther, or they may just be the results of living in a fallen world. Those things happen too. They happen too. So it can be th through the choices of sinful man that... You know, people do stupid things, and, and so the, the repercussions trickle way down, and maybe you and I happen to get caught up in the, the, uh, the repercussions, the consequences of, some, of a choice that somebody else has made. Or it may be just that, you know, we live in this fallen world, and difficult times come. They do, but let me go on. But let us never forget that God has permitted them so that he will be glorified in whatever takes place. And I emphasize whatever. And listen, he could stop anything from coming into your life that would cause pain in your heart. He could stop anything from coming into my life that would cause pain in my heart. But sometimes he permits it. Sometimes he permits it. And what I got to hold on to and what you got to hold on to is the fact that the underlying theme of the scriptures is that God will be glorified. So he's going to use the situation to glorify himself. Listen to this. Even the death of a loved one. Let me show you. John 11, 1 through 4. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her, and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary that anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, the Lord, the, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death. That's not the ultimate, that's not going to be the ultimate result of this sickness. But here comes the ultimate result. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. There's that underlying theme. There it is again. Watch the next paragraph. The end result must be for our good based upon what Romans 8.28 tells us. Okay, so, so, so here's the deal. All things work together for our good. It doesn't mean they won't be painful. It doesn't mean that that we are not going to lose people. It doesn't mean that we won't shed tears. It, th that's not what's meant by that. It's not what's meant by that. For our good to mold and to shape us into the image of Christ and ultimately so that we can be used in a way that God will be glorified. That's what it's about. That's what this is about right here. Why would God ever deliver this beautiful young woman who some people say she was around the year the age of 19 some say she might have been less than that why would god permit that young lady to enter into this beauty pageant where she's got to spend one night with a king who's looking to satisfy his own personal lusts what would be how could anything good come out of that but god will permit it and not listen there's, these people are still going to be held accountable. 
but God will, will permit it because the end result is going to be his glorification in all of this. Let me go on. Let me, let me get down here again. I'll read that paragraph there again. The end result must be for our good based upon what Romans 8.28 tells us. So our response is to walk by faith when the pressure, the affliction, the trials, and the storms enter our lives. There is no better verse than Psalm 46.10 when we are faced with a situation that we have absolutely no control over. Psalm 46.10 says this, Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. There it is again. I will be exalted in the earth. There it is again. There's no better verse than that whenever we are faced with something that we have no control over. Watch the, the words of Joseph Carroll on this verse, if I could. And he says this, and I quote, Be still and know that I am God. As if the Lord had said, not a word. Do not strive nor reply. Whatever you see, hold your peace. Know that I, being God, give no account of any of my matters. Unquote. So I go back to that whole theme again. And whenever I understand the book of Esther and I, I know what we are looking at and I know that because we can read ahead and, and we know what's coming and we know the end and, and how, it's, how it's all going to come together. And so we can, God allows, this has all been recorded. And so I can come back here knowing the end result and I can say this was all for God's glory. And I look at Esther and I say she ended up in a situation, no doubt, I don't think she wanted to be in that situation. I don't think that was her desire. I don't think that was her desire at all to be in that situation. She seems like such a humble lady whenever you look at some of the things that are recorded here. And I'll kind of bring those out as we go a little bit further along. It would have been a difficult situation. Here's a young lady taken in with a pagan king, a drunk at times, pagan king uh, that is caught up in his self. You remember uh, back a while ago, I read for you uh, that this guy, they found all kinds of uh, inscriptions, how this guy promoted himself, the great king, the, the greatest of all kings. And so he thought very highly of himself. Let me uh, come back to Esther chapter 2, verse 11. Let me read you some verses. 11 through 14. We'll move on now. That was just considering that question that I raised. Verse 11 says this, Mordecai walked every day. Okay, she's already been taken into the, or, or, or she's already a part of this group of women. So it says, Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what would become of her. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, after that, she had been 12 months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of her purification accomplished, to wit, six months with oil, myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for purifying of the women. So before these young ladies went into the king, they had six months of, uh, I guess, 12 months of spa treatment. It was, I guess you would condense it that way, uh, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors. I tell you what, I'm sure there was a cloud hanging over wherever they kept them from all the midnight in Persia uh, <laughs> perfume that they use. Verse 13, watch this. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given to her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening, now watch this, this is sad, this is very sad, to me it is. In the evening she went in, and on the morrow she returned, a night with him, a night. She returned unto the second house of the women, to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, then she were called, and that she were called by name. Now. Okay, so let me, let me explain something, and I think I have it wrote out here, but I want you to, I say 
this is so heartbreaking to me. They gather all these young ladies up and they run them through this spa treatment for a year. Only one of them is going to be chosen. The other ones that are rejected, they're not going back to society. They're going into the harem. They become a concubine. Watch this. Let me show you something. Mordecai paced back and forth being anxious concerning Esther. Each young girl went through one year of spa treatment before she was brought before the king. Each one then spent one night with the king as he sought to satisfy his own sexual desires. If the young girl was not chosen by the king, she then became a part of the king's concubines. In other words, she became a part of the king's harem. She might never again be called into the presence of the king. I want you to notice the, what the Easton's Bible Dictionary says concerning concubines to help you with this. Watch this. This word denotes a female united in marriage to a man, but in a relation inferior to that of a wife. Among the early Jews, from various causes, the difference between a wife and a concubine was less marked than it would be amongst us. The concubine was a wife of secondary rank. There are various laws regarded or recorded providing for their protection and setting limits to the relation they sustained to the household to which they belonged. They had no authority in the family, nor could they share in the household government. The immediate cause of concubines might be gathered from the marriage histories of Abraham and Jacob, but in the process of time, the custom of concubinage degenerated and laws were made to restrain and regulate it. Christianity has restored the sacred institution of marriage to its original character, and concubinage is ranked with the sins of fornication and adultery. But let me go on. So, okay, let me hold on. So, if they were not chosen to be, become the queen, they still became a concubine and they were still in the harem. So with that said, watch the next paragraph. If the young girls were not chosen to be queen, they were not just sent back into society, but they were made concubines, in other words, secondary wives of the king. They were not the king's first choice and no one else could take them to be their wife. It was as if the king did not want them, and neither did he want anyone else to have them. He's not concerned that the young girls could never marry, and some might never be called forth from the second harem. You see what this society is like? You said that this is barbaric. This is, I mean, it takes all these young virgins, and, and I told you Josephus tells us, that it's believed that there were over 400 of them, and one of them is going to be chosen. The rest of them are going into the harem. They could, if, they, if either the king wanted, he could call one of them up out of the harem, but a lot of them never got called again. Neither could they go out in society and marry. They couldn't do that because they belonged to the king. They belonged to the king. That's the kind of guy that we're dealing with right here. Watch verse 15. Watch this. Now, when a turn of Esther, the daughter of... Abihail, the son of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king. She required nothing, now watch this, but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. There's something interesting here I wanted you to see. Watch this. When I read this verse, I see the wisdom which Esther possessed. She trusted Haggai to give, it should say her, the best advice let me read that verse again. I want you to catch this. Watch this. Verse 15. While when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing, watch this, but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. So she trusts this guy. Why she trusts this guy? Why, why did she say that? Okay, so understand this guy knows the king. Okay, so back here. He knew the king better than anyone, so he would certainly know what Esther needed to win the king's favor. Here's the application. There are two verses that come to my mind here, and, and then an application. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12, watch this. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. 
them as far as Israel in the Old Testament. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now, now watch what I have here. When we're looking at the story of Esther, uh, what we are looking at in the story of Esther is for our admonition. In the case of Esther in 2.15 and how she trusted Haggai, the lesson for us is that we must be sure to listen to those who give us sound advice. We may think we know better and that we have all the answers to life's decisions, but I can assure you we do not. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.12 to be careful of thinking you have all the answers and that you do not need advice of those who have lived on the path that you are walking. You think you will stand, but you will fall if you are not willing to learn from others. That's what he's saying. If someone has given you sound, godly advice, then you better listen. God has placed them in your life to, to point you in the right direction and possibly save you a great deal of heartache, which may come from a poor decision made according to the desires of the flesh. Let me show you a couple verses. Proverbs 11:14 says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But the multitude of counselors, they are, uh, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 20, 15, I, li I like this one. Watch this. There is gold in a multitude of rubies. That's usually what people go after. Watch this. Watch the contrast. But the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Let me put that into perspective. You can go through life and you can gather gold and you can gather a multitude of rubies, but if you have somebody in your life that can speak knowledge and wisdom to you, that makes you far better off and far more wealthy than if you had all the gold and all the rubies of the world. That's far more valuable. The lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Proverbs uh, 24, 5, and 6. A wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. There is safety. So, all that said to say, she takes his advice. She doesn't, she doesn't take anything. She trusts him to give her the advice to be able to go into the king. Watch 16 and 17. So Esther was taken into, unto King Ahasuerus in the house, in his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tabith, in the seventh year of his reign. So we're four years beyond the, 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 the big feast that took place in chapter 1. Watch verse 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Okay, so the stage is set, but we're not done with this yet. Watch this. Esther is crowned queen approximately four years after the events of chapter 1. Because of God, she has found grace in the eyes of the king. God has worked all the events in order that he would be glorified. Here's the application. There is something in these verses that bring a lesson for our lives. God did not rush to get Esther into the position of queen. It took roughly four years for God's plan to come together. He did not make haste, but his timing was perfect. This is a truth that we need to keep in mind as we pass through this world. God has a set time for everything. He does not panic, nor does he rush. He will work his plan in such a way that he gets all the glory. Don't forget that. Remember, that's the underlying theme. Genesis 17, 19 through 21. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee, watch this, at this set time in the next year. Not until it is my time, God says. Then Sarah will bear a son that you will call Isaac. 
Genesis 21, 1 through 5. The fulfillment. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Perfect timing. I'll get to that in a moment. Watch this. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old. I underline that, and I emphasize that, when his son Isaac was born unto here. That means Sarah was 90. You already know the story. You know that. They're beyond the childbearing years. They're way beyond the childbearing years. It's just, this, humanly speaking, this makes absolutely no sense at all. But the point that I want you to understand is this, that God was not in a hurry. He waited. He waited till they got beyond the childbearing years because then Abraham could take absolutely no credit. He could take none. There's multiple reasons why God waited. Number one, uh, uh, Isaac would be a type of Christ, and so he had to be a miracle son in order to be a type of Christ. But also... God would be glorified in this. So God waits. He waits till there's, humanly speaking, there's no way that this can happen. Remember, one of the most important lessons to learn from the birth of Isaac is this for our lives. Listen to me. That God's power is not limited by our ability or inability. You understand that you got a situation before you whatever it might be with God all things are possible you say why well, I don't really have anything to contribute well I can assure you neither did Abraham or Sarah they had nothing to contribute whatsoever absolutely nothing but God's power wasn't limited it wasn't hindered by that it was not not at all neither is it in our lives Neither is it. Watch the top of page 7. God waited until Abraham and Sarah were well beyond the childbearing years to allow her to become pregnant. This would ensure that God was glorified and not Abraham. There was a set time and Isaac would not be born until that set time. To everything in our lives, there is a set time. We could borrow the words of Solomon and uh, out of Ecclesiastes for that, but we didn't. And God will bring his plan for you together at the set time. Let us be careful, catch this, not to try to rush his timing. For then we only cause heartache for ourselves and others around us. I will go back. I'm, I'm going to finish up with a verse that we already looked at. I'm going to go back here to something. Psalm 46.10. This is hard for me. This, this, just to catch what's being said here, I, I'll be honest with you. It's difficult for me, but it's what, I'm, what we're supposed to do. And so don't think that I'm preaching only to you, but God's using it on me. Be still and know that I am God. So these situations come into our lives that we have no control over. Sinful people make sinful choices. We get caught up in them. We get caught up in them. Just like, just like uh, Esther getting caught up in this whole thing. And we, we look at that and we say... What in the world, you know, if, if, you, if you're in that situation? What good can come out of this? Why has this happened? Why am I here? I'll answer that so that God can be glorified. That's why. So what do I do? I remain still. And I trust that my God is in control of everything. And I pray, if I could extend it further, I pray that God will be glorified, not only in the circumstance, but also in my response. I could say this, if I could bear my heart to you, that's my prayer for my own life. That whenever the painful situations come, God, let me respond in a way that glorifies you. Let me be controlled by the Spirit so that Lord, whatever, there may be tears, there may be great heartache, and I, I, I may feel like that the world is caving in around me, but Lord, let me glorify you with that. 
for Lord, that's one of the reasons why you brought it. That's the ultimate purpose of why you've allowed it to come. Be still and know that I am God. It's not easy. It's not easy. Sometimes it's just not saying anything. Boy, you want to, don't you? The flesh just wants to snap back like a rattlesnake. Sometimes we got to just be quiet. We got to let God in the situation run its course. And remember that God has a set time. And his power isn't limited because of me not being able to change the situation, to have no power to change it. That doesn't limit his power. I try to do this anymore. I try to live in expectation of what he's going to do. I pray about a situation and I say, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. But Lord, I want to live in expectation that you're going to do something. That you're going to do something. So, <laughs> next week we're going to come back. And I didn't touch on it this week. We'll touch briefly. After, he found, after the king got Esther, then he's going to throw a big old banquet. and He's going he's gonna to send gifts out. It's like Christmas in Persia. Uh, whenever he got Esther. But then there's another event in that chapter that's going to turn out to be very significant, which we will get, and we'll talk about God in the midst of that. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for what we are able to look at here tonight. Lord, don't let us forget, never forget, that the underlying theme of the Bible is that you will be glorified. And so that means that because we live in a sinful, fallen world, that there's going to be times that there's heartache. There's going to be times, Lord, when we won't be able to make sense out of what's happening. But, Father, we study this so that we can be prepared and know that behind the scenes, when we can't even see you at work, Lord, you're there working to glorify yourself. Father, things happen today. And we may never see the results in this life. It might not be that we stand before you and then we understand what it was all about. Our responsibility is to be still and to trust you. Sure, Lord, I know there are times whenever we stand for the truth of your word. I know that, Lord. I'm not, we are not talking, I am not talking to the people about being apathetic by any means talking about those situations, Lord, that we don't have any control over, that we don't have any power to change them. And I thank you, Father, that your power is not limited because of our inability, not at all, for with you all things are possible. Dear Lord, for the one here tonight that faces something that they cannot change, might they be encouraged tonight. Starting with me tonight, Father. Take us home safely. Give us a good week. Bring us back on Sunday to be blessed by the Spirit of God. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.